Jacob Burton here from StellaCulinary.com, and it's time for another installment of Food Science 101. In this multi-video series, we'll be discussing the science behind the brining process. Now, since we'll be covering so much material in this video series, I've created one singular resource page uh, that you can find at StellaCulinary.com slash brine, and I very strongly encourage you to visit and bookmark this resource page, uh, which will contain everything you ever want to know about brines, including uh, this presentation and all of our videos within this series. Ready? Let's get started. So first, what is a brine? Well, in its simplest form, a brine is a salt and water solution that food products, most commonly meats, are soaked in for a given period of time to improve the product's overall quality. Now, I make the distinction of saying that brines improve food products because things other than proteins or meat can be enhanced through the brining process such as fruits and vegetables. But a brine's most uh, practical application is to enhance that of a protein, uh, which is what this video series will mainly explore. Now, why should you brine something? Well, brining uh, is a great technique that can improve the overall quality of a food product with three major benefits. Number one is textural improvement, especially when it comes to brining proteins. Number two, brines can and will enhance overall flavor. Not only does the salt contained within a brine help to season the food product, assuming the brine is applied correctly, but brines also commonly contain secondary flavor profiles such as herbs, spices, and aromatics that are chosen specifically to enhance the overall flavor of the food product being brined. Number three is by far the biggest reason food is brined, and that's moisture retention, especially when it comes to cooking things that are lean proteins such as chicken breast, pork tenderloin, uh, and fish. Brining allows proteins to retain more moisture throughout the cooking process, resulting in a moisture-finished product. But to understand how a brine improves a product's texture, flavor, and ability to retain moisture, we must first understand how brines actually work. So the most conventional explanation of how brining works describes the movement of salt and water into proteins through a process called osmosis. This, however, is incorrect. Brining actually works through diffusion, not osmosis. And it's important to make that distinction if we are to truly understand how a brine works. First, let's talk diffusion. Let's assume that this yellow square here is air trapped in a vacuum. Now, in this air, we have dissolved gas represented by these red dots. And at this moment, the gas is more heavily concentrated at the bottom left corner of the square. As the dissolved gas continues to freely move around in this vacuum of air, let's think for a second what would happen if a gas molecule started to move towards the bottom left corner of this container. Obviously, it would run into some resistance, making the probability of it freely reaching the bottom left corner very unlikely. What's more, as this molecule uh, comes into contact with its neighbor, it will actually ricochet off and travel in the opposite direction of which it was initially moving. So conversely, if a dissolved gas molecule in this container tried to move to the top right corner to an area of lower concentration, it would actually encounter much less resistance, so the probability of it ending up in the top right corner of this container is statistically pretty good. And this is basically diffusion in action. If given enough time, these molecules will move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Now, osmosis, on the other hand, deals specifically with the movement of water from an area of higher concentration to that of a lower concentration through a semi-permeable membrane. Now, before we move on, let's go over some quick terminology here so you can better understand this process. First, whenever you have less of something dissolved into more of something, you have a solution. So a brine can actually be thought of as a salt water solution in which salt is dissolved in the water. The thing you have more of in a solution, in this case the water, is called the solvent. And the thing you have less of, in this case the salt, is called the solute. To illustrate this, let's draw a little diagram here. So here I have a container of some water. And since we're going to assume that we will be dissolving something into this water, the water will be our solvent. 
Now, in this water, we have a semi-permeable membrane, meaning some things can pass through the membrane while others can't. And this membrane separates the water molecules into two distinct areas. On the right-hand side of this membrane, we have larger solute molecules that are too large to fit through the opening in the semi-permeable membrane. For osmosis to occur, you must have a semi-permeable membrane in which the solvent can pass through, in this case the water, but the solute can't. The reason why osmosis works is because when you have billions of molecules randomly bouncing around, some of the solute molecules will randomly be approaching the membrane's opening, shown here on the right-hand side, while a water molecule is approaching the opening on the same side of the membrane. So even though the large solute molecule isn't completely blocking the membrane's opening, it is still large enough to block certain approach paths. So as a water molecule starts to randomly move towards the membrane's opening, there's a good chance or probability it will run into a larger solute molecule and ricochet off, never making it through to the other side. It's important to understand that osmosis is based purely on the probability of water's molecular movement over time. Because the solute molecules on the right side of the membrane are too large to pass through the membrane's opening, it is more likely over time that more water on the left-hand side of the membrane will pass through to the right than water on the right will pass to the left. This process of water being statistically more likely to move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration while passing through a semi-permeable membrane is the definition of osmosis. So if osmosis did occur during the brining process, here's how it would actually work. If you placed a chicken breast into a brine, the salt would be considered the solute. That would mean, if osmosis really were at play, the water contained within the chicken breast would actually have to move outward into the brine. To break this down a little further, if osmosis occurred during the brining process, two things would have to be true. Number one, the solute, or the dissolved salt, would have to be too large to penetrate a protein's outer membrane. We know this is false because the interior of brined meat can obviously become salty. Number two, if the salt was actually too big to pass through the protein's outer membrane, which it's not, then the moisture within the object being brine would actually flow outward into the solution, since in osmosis, water will flow through a semi-permeable membrane from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. And remember, that semi-permeable membrane, its opening must be too small to allow the solute or the salt through, which is not the case. But since we know through basic observation that both water and salt will enter into a protein during the brining process, we can conclude that brining works through diffusion, not osmosis. Now, the natural question is, well, why do we need salt in the first place? I mean, besides seasoning, of course. If water moves into a protein through diffusion, why can't we just soak a protein in water and have it become juicier? And the answer to this is, well... Technically, you can. You can soak a protein in pure water, and it will swell, taking on additional water weight, but not as much as if you added salt to the soaking liquid. And more specifically, proteins also will not bind to water as effectively during the cooking process unless salt is present. Now, why this actually occurs is extremely interesting, and we'll be discussing this process in more depth in part two of this brining video.